Erev Rosh Kadesh Tammuz. Welcome everyone to the evening service for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA. We welcome everyone who's here with us and for those who will listen in later on the archives, we pray that this is a blessing to each and every one of you. Well, we are here on the eve of a new Hebrew calendar month. Also, this is a new moon, which is an appointed Moedim. So we are going to go over quite a bit this evening. Uh, Before we do that, before we get started with anything, I'm going to open this up to our opening prayer and invite the Holy Spirit in to lead us and guide us. Avina Malkinu, our Father, our King, we thank you for the ability to be together. We thank you for your appointed times, the the new moons being, being appointed times, which again bring in the Hebrew calendar months, which is on your timeline. We thank you, Father God, for everything that you do. We ask the Holy Spirit to come lead us, guide us, direct us, and teach us. Open the eyes of our heart and the ears of our heart that we may be open and receptive to your word. We thank you. We worship and adore you. We give you our praise. We give you our our honor and our glory in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, it is July 29th, and this is the very last day of the month of Sivan, which is a 30-day 30 day month um, in the Hebrew calendar. Tomorrow begins Tammuz 1, and that begins June 30th on the Gregorian calendar and ends June 29th. I'm, I'm sorry, July 29th, um, which it, it, it's, it is actually a 29 day month. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this will, this will run from June 30th. To July 28th. And on the 29th is the month of Av. Um, so that's at the very end of July. So in this new month that we're, we're bringing in, we've got four Shabbats. However, I do want to mention in the month of July, there are actually five Shabbats. So our first Shabbat, of course, is July 2nd. And that is Parashat Korah, or Korah. And um, then we have Parashat Chukat. It's spelled C-H-U-K-A-T. And it means statute or ordinances. Um, And then we have Balak. And then we have Pincus, or Phineas. And then, of course, the very last... um, the very last Shabbat for the month of July will fall in the month of Av. And that is actually a double parashat. It, it is Metot and Messai, tribes and journeys. But that, again, is in the month of Av. So we have four Shabbats that we'll be covering during this month. Now, um, Tammuz can be spelled T-A-M-M-U-Z or T-A-M-U-Z. It is the 10th month of the civil calendar year. And we've mentioned this before. The civil calendar year begins in Tishri. It's when we celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. However, Not to confuse anybody, but the biblical calendar year, or what is known as the ecclesiastical year on the Hebrew calendar, begins with Nisan. Uh, so, so if we begin with Nisan, this would be the fourth month of the biblical calendar year. And again, as I mentioned, Tammuz is, is 29 days. It occurs on the Gregorian calendar around June or July. So here we are at the very end of June. Now, holidays in Tammuz, um, the only thing we have going on is the 17th of Tammuz, and that's a fast day from one hour before sunrise to sundown in remembrance of Jerusalem's walls being breached. Now, as we know, um, you know, as we were counting Omer leading up to Shavuot, this is a three weeks, um, this is three weeks coming 
culminating up to the 9th of Av, which is a very, very sad day in our history. Um, it, on that day, um, actually, um, both temples were destroyed. So, and that is um, also known as Tishba Av. So that, that will occur in the month of Av, but these are the three weeks leading up to it. So, um, and there are some Ashkenazi uh, communities refrain from wine and meat from beginning the beginning of the month of Av, um, while Sephardic communities only do so from the second day of the month. Um, the, uh, and the morning continues until noon on the 10th of Av, um, the date on which the second temple's destruction was complete. So we're going to also go over the history. Um, there's some there's some things historically that happened in this month uh, of Tammuz, and um, also then we will read the scripture that we read on for every Rosh Kadesh, and we will do an altar call, and then we will also do um, Holy Communion as well. So that's what's going on for the rest of this service this evening, so you know what to expect. I just want to mention um, Shabbat for Saturday is July 2nd. Um, also, we, we do Holy Communion on the first Shabbat of every um, new Gregorian calendar month. So um, those are the two times we pretty much do um, Holy Communion. Uh, we also have, you know, additional times throughout the year, but every month you can count on those two uh, opportunities that you can come to the table of the Lord. Some historical dates in the month of Tammuz, the third of Tammuz in 1272 BC, Joshua stopped the sun uh, in the book of Joshua, uh, chapters 10, uh, verses 1 to 15. Then we have in 1927, the sixth Lubavicker, uh, Rabbi Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak uh, Schneerson was released from prison and sentenced to three years of exile in the city of Kostroma. And also um, the third of Tammuz in 1994 was the death of Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavicker Rabbi. So on the 4th of Tammuz in 1171, there was the death of Rabbanu Tam. And in the 4th Tammuz in 1286, Meyer of Rothenburg was imprisoned. Now, biblically, we go from, from the 3rd of Tammuz when Joshua stopped the sun um, in 1272. Also a biblical date, uh, the 5th of Tammuz, 592 BC, Ezekiel receives his chariot vision. Um, and uh, the sixth of Tammuz is, is in 1976, the Operation Entebbe. Now back to the biblical history, five, 586 BC, on the 9th of Tammuz, Jerusalem's walls were breached by Nebuchadnezzar the second, a date observed as a fast day until the second breaching of Jerusalem's walls by the Roman Empire on the 17th of Tammuz in 70 C AD rather. Um, so they had observed this, at, you know, this had been observed as a fast day until the second one occurred, um, which was on the 17th of Tammuz um, when the walls were breached. So the 12th to the 13th of Tammuz in 1927, there was the release of Kabad Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson from prison in Kostroma, Soviet Union, observed by Kabad Hasidim as a holy day. The 15th of Tammuz in 1743 was the death of Chaim Ibn Attar, and biblical his, history date of the 17th of, of Tammuz, 1312, the golden calf was offered by the Jewish people 40 days after the giving of the Torah at Har Sinai. In response, Mo, Moses smashed the first tablets. This is the first of the five national tragedies mourned on this day. 
Also, on the 17th of Tammuz in 586 BC, the Corban in Solomon's temple were discontinued. The 17th of Tammuz, uh, the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Roman army in 70 AD. And the 17th of Tammuz in 135, uh, the Roman general uh, Apostamus burned the Torah and placed an idol in the second temple, Bar Koba, the Bar Koba revolt. And that was in 135 AD. And in the 21st of Tammuz in 1636, the death of Kabbalist Baal Shem Elijah, Lone's grandson of Johanan Luria and Josel of Rosham, an author of Mikol Yofi in Amsterdam, 16. 95, a commentary on Ecclesiastes. Um, Tammuz 21 and 2020, the last remaining Jews of Yemen are, were captured by the Houthi militia. So that was an unfortunate date also in, in, in our time. And in 1792, the death of Shlomo Carlin on the 22nd of Tammuz, the 23rd of Tammuz in 1570, the death of, of Moses ben Jacob, Cordovero and Tammuz 26 in 2005, the death of Rabbi Shlomo Zeb Zweigenhaft, and then the 28th of Tammuz 1841, the death of Rab Rabbi Moshe Teitelbaum, and the 29th of Tammuz in 150 AD was the death of Johann Kassandlar, and Tammuz 29 in 1105, the death of Rashi, and Tammuz 29, 1940, the death of Zeev Jabotinsky, sec the secular observance by Israel as Jabotinsky Day. So as I mentioned, Tammuz is the fourth of the 12 months of the Jewish calendar, the biblical calendar, counting from Nisan. However, it's the 10th on the civil year. The month of Tammuz begins the season of summer. The three months of this season are Tammuz, Av, and Elul. So again, the 17th day of Tammuz is a fast day that commemorates the day when the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Romans, um, and it marks the beginning of the period known as the three weeks. This is an annual mourning period when we mourn the destruction of the Holy Temple and the cause of our current ongoing the, the, uh, of the exile. And it reaches its climax and concludes with the fast of the ninth of Av, the day when both holy temples were set aflame um, by the Babyl Babylonians, um, you know, in the Old Testament and in the new, and in the new, um, actually, actually in 70 A.D. by the Romans, rather. Uh, because of this and numerous other tragedies that occurred throughout the history. Um, during this period, we lessen the extent of our rejoicing during the three-week period leading up to it. So um, there was a lot of bad stuff that happened um, during this time of the year, of course, um, as we had mentioned. So this is a time of mourning. Um, Tishba Av and the three weeks. The three weeks is an annual mourning period that falls out in the summer. Um, this is when we mourn the destruction of the Holy Temple and our launch into still ongoing exile because a lot of us are not in Israel at this point. We had, we had all been scattered um, and there are some that are making Aliyah and, and returning to the Holy Land. Now, when we talk about the three weeks, we, and the, the final nine days of the three weeks are a time of intensified mourning. Um, starting on the 1st of Av, uh, we, we actually um, focused more um, on it because we're, we're actually getting into the, the closer to the time frame of the destruction of the first and second holy temples. So, and there's the entire month of Av uh, is considered to be um, a, an, an opportune time because of all of the tragedies that occurred, you know, during, during that time frame. So we'll get into a lot more um, 
of those um, and uh, leading up to Tishba uh, um, next month. So just a, a little heads up. Um, these are the th th these are the weeks leading into the month of uh, So we're going to get into the scripture readings now for this evening, beginning with Numbers chapter 28, Rosh Kadesh, New Moon, and that is beginning with verse 11. On the first of the month, you are to present Adonai a burnt offering up to young bulls, one ram, and seven flawless male lambs a year old, with three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, as a grain offering with each bowl and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering with a ram and with each lamb a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering a burnt offering as a pleasing aroma an aroma by fire to adonai their drink offering shall be per bowl, per bowl half a hen of wine a third of a hen of wine per ram and a fourth of a hen per lamb this will be the monthly burnt offering at each new moon throughout the year. Also, one male goat as a sin offering to Adonai besides the regular burnt offering is to be offered with its drink offering. Psalm 81, hear, O Israel, for the music director on the Gittite lyre of Asaph. Sing for joy to God our strength and shout to the God of Jacob. Lift up a song and sound a tambourine, a sweet lyre with a harp. Blow the shofar at new moon, at the full moon for the day of our festival. For it is a decree for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He set it up as a testimony in Joseph when he went throughout the land of Egypt. I heard a language I did not understand. I relieved his shoulder of the burden. His hands were set free from the basket. You called out in trouble, and I rescued you. I answered you from the hiding place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, my people, I will admonish you. If you would listen to me, O Israel, let there be no foreign god among you, and you shall not worship any alien god. I am Adonai, your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel was not willing to be mine. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate Adonai would cringe before him. Their time of doom would be forever, but you would be fed with the finest wheat. With honey out of a rock would I satisfy you. In Psalm 113 to 118, we also do at this time. It's it, th these psalms are known as the Hallel. So we are going to read Psalm one, starting with one thirteen. From the rising of the sun, Hallelujah! Praise, O servants of Adonai! Praise the name of Adonai! Blessed be the name of Adonai from now and forever. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the name of Adonai is to be praised. Adonai is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens, who is like Adonai, our God, enthroned on high, who brings himself down to look upon heaven and upon earth. He raises the poor from the dust, lifts up the needy out of the dunghill to seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. And the Passover song. When Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob's house from the people formed speaking. Judah became his sanctuary. Israel, his dominion, the seesaw, and fled the Jordan, turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it, O seas, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back. O mountains, that you skipped like rams. O hills, like lambs, tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. In Psalm 115, bless the maker of heaven and earth. Not to us, that of mine, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Because of your love and your faithfulness, 
why should the nations say, where is their God now? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever pleases him. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor utter a sound with their throat. Those making them will become like them, everyone trusting in them. O Israel, trust in Adonai. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Adonai. He is their help and their shield. O you who fear Adonai, trust in Adonai. He is their help and their shield. Adonai has been mindful of us. He will bless. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear Adonai, the small together with the great. May Adonai increase you more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by Adonai, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens are the heavens of Adonai, but the earth he gave to the children of men. The dead do not praise Adonai, nor do any who go down into silence. We, we will bless Adonai both now and forever. Hallelujah. In Psalm 116, lift up the cup of salvation. I love Adonai, for he hears my voice, my cries, because he has turned his ear to me. I will call on him all my days. The ropes of death entangled me, and the torments of Sheol found me. I found trouble and sorrow, then I called upon the name of Adonai. Adonai saved my soul. Adonai is gracious and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. Adonai protects the simple-hearted. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for Adonai has been good to you. For you delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before Adonai in the lands of the living. I trusted even when I said I am very afflicted, even when I said in my haste all men are liars. How can I repay Adonai for all his bounties to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of Adonai. I will fulfill my vows to Adonai in the presence of all his people. Precious, in the sight of Adonai is the death of his Kedashim. O oh, Adonai, surely I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maid servant. You have freed me from my bonds. To you I will offer sacrifice of praise and will call in the name of Adonai. I will fulfill my vows to Adonai in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of Adonai, in your midst, O Jerusalem, hallelujah. Psalm 117, praise him, all you nations. Praise Adonai, all you nations. Glorify him, all you peoples. For great is his loving kindness towards us, and Adonai's truth endures forever, hallelujah. His kessed endures forever, his mercy or loving kindness, that means. And that is Psalm 118. Praise Adonai, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. Oh, let Israel say, for his loving kindness endures forever. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, for his loving kindness endures forever. Oh, let those who fear Adonai say, for his loving kindness endures forever. Out of a tight place, I called on Adonai. Adonai answered me with a spacious place. Adonai is for me, and I will not fear. What can man do to me? Adonai is for me as my helper. I will see the downfall of those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in Adonai than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in Adonai than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me in the name of Adonai. I cut them off. They surrounded me, yes, all around me in the name of Adonai. I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees. They were extinguished like burning thorns. In the name of Adonai, I cut them off. You pushed me hard to make me fall, but Adonai helped me. Adonai is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory are in the tents of the righteous. Adonai's right hand is mighty. Adonai's right hand is lifted high. Adonai's right hand is mighty. I will not die, but live and proclaim what Adonai has done. Adonai has chastened me hard, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I might enter, that I may enter through them and praise Adonai. This is the gate of Adonai. The righteous will enter through it. I give you thanks because you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. It is from Adonai. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that Adonai has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hoshiana, please, Adonai, save now. We beseech you, Adonai, prosper us. Baruch Ababa Sham Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name 
of Adonai. We bless you from the house of Adonai. Adonai is God, and he has given us light. Join the festival with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I praise you. You are my God, I exalt you. Praise Adonai, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. And say with me now the Shehekienu, Baruch Eta Adonai Eloheno Melech HaOlam. Shehekienu, Begimanu, Behegianu, Lazman Hazay. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion, this occasion of a new Hebrew calendar month. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this brand new month. We thank you for the new moon. We thank you for your appointed times. We know that they are important and we are honoring you. Thank you so much for all that you do, all that you have done, all that you are doing and all that you're about to do. We have repented and we, we are returning. We have returned to you, Father God. Um, we see in history all that be that that has befallen our ancestors and and how it scattered all of us all over the place and we ask for your mercies even though we're not worthy but you did give us your one and only son to redeem us we we hold him so high in esteem he is our beloved savior he's our mashiach he's our king of kings and our lord of lords we pray this in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. And with that, we're going to open to our altar call, which is extremely important. Salvation. We're talking about salvation. Salvation can only be achieved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. Uh, he was sinless, blameless, spotless, and he came to redeem us from sin and reconcile us to the Father. He took all of the sins of the world with him when he laid down his life on a cross. He was crucified on that cross. He died. He was buried, and he was resurrected again, and he will be returning again to rule and reign as the king of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, before Yeshua, before Jesus came to earth, there had been a sacrificial system that was in place, and that involved sacrificing animals, which was the substitute for for people paying the price of their sins, and because the wages of sin are death. So God allowed for a substitution. And God loved his creation, his human, humanity so much that he gave us Yeshua to be our substitution once and for all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world that the world would be condemned but through him the world may be saved. While you have breath in your lungs, you have that ability to accept the Lord as your Savior. And he is the only one that can save you. You can't save yourself. If that were possible, he would never have had to come and die for us. So, but the, it's not possible. We were born into a fleshly body that dies. And that is the result of what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. They actually lost their glorified body. Which was the covering of the glory of God covered them. So, um, they were told to not... Well, actually, Adam was told to not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve was also aware that she was not to do it either, but she was tempted by the evil one uh, who disguised himself as a serpent, um, and he twisted the words of God 
um, got her to actually look at that and look at the tree and she saw that it was good. So she disobeyed it, the Lord and um, got Adam to do so too. But Adam knew he heard right from God. He could have stopped that at any time, but he did not. Uh, and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Um, and also at that point, um, they, they could not return. Um, Genesis 3, um, Genesis 3 verse 15 actually foretells of Jesus, of Yeshua also. Um, that's pr very prophetic. Uh, this is, this is, this is Adonai speaking. I will put animosity between you and the woman. He's addressing the evil one, the serpent, um, between your seed and her seed. He, he will crush your head and you will crush his heel. Now he, he was referred to is Yeshua who came later, of course. And what Yeshua did with his death on the cross, he reversed the curse. So no, you can't save yourself. Uh, he would not have had to go through all of that. And it was hor horrific what he went through because he, he loved us that much. Salvation is deliverance from sin and their consequences. And also, uh, prior to going to the cross, the Roman soldiers beat him horribly. And one of the stripes uh, was for our illnesses and afflictions. So this is, he was wounded for our transgressions. So by his stripes, we are healed. Uh, Romans chapter three, verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We didn't have a choice after Adam and Eve. We were born into sin and the and flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua addressed um, the fact um, that we all need to be born again um, and born of the, he meant born of the spirit and it's born of his spirit through his finished work on the cross, accepting him as our, our, as our savior. Also repenting of your sins and, and you need to be sure that your sins are, are, are forgiven as well because sin cannot stand before a holy God. That's exactly what happened in the garden of Eden when, when, when Adonai was disobeyed, um, sin came to earth for the first time. So, and sin cannot stand before a holy God. The wages of sin are death. And that is separation from, from God. Now God had warned, um, warned Adam and Eve uh, that they would surely die. And they did. They died a spiritual death. They lost the glory covering uh, that God had on them. Romans chapter five, verse eight says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Yeshua died for us. You can't get to heaven on your own merits. Um, no one can buy their way into heaven. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Your money is going to mean nothing in heaven or in hell. So, you must be born again and you must, Yeshua is the only way. He had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except by me. So it's pretty, pretty clear. First John chapter one, verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you are not saved, this world looks pretty scary uh, about now with all, you know, for the last couple years um, to many, but you can have that peace that passes all understanding. You have the promise of, of eternal life. Your spirit will go on. Uh, nothing, you know, what man can do to you um, is nothing. In comparison to you, you, you certainly don't want to, you don't want to be separated from, from Father God forever. It, eternity 
what I'm trying to elicit here is eternity is forever. What you're living, your the life that you're living now is very temporary. It will end um, this physical life, this earth suit that you inhabit. You're going to actually vacate um, when it is your time, but your spirit goes on forever. Now, where it's going to go on is up to you. God gives us free will. He gives us a choice. So choose this day wisely whom you will serve. I'm going to say another another important fact here that um, when, when you ask to have your sins forgiven, please come with a sincere heart. Don't come with the intention. There, there's many people out there that think that, oh, I can get my sins forgiven and then I'm going to go right back out and do what do what, do what I want to do. Uh, no, that's, that's the wrong attitude. When we prepare to take Holy Communion, I am going to read Psalm 51. It's going to be a perfect example of a repentant heart. And that was the heart of King David. That was the heart of a king who had sinned against God. And, and when he realized what he had done uh, to the extent that he had fallen uh, he was sorrowful. And that that is important to, to really think about as you come and you ask the Lord to forgive you. What you're wanting to be is, your, yes, you do want your hand to have sin, sin forgiven uh, and, and you cleansed of sin. However, you want to do it with the intention of changing changing the way you're doing things and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you for the rest of your life. So if you are ready to say this prayer with me, you can say a simple prayer with me and, and know that you know that you know that you're saved and you are born again and you're Destination after this life is in heaven. You don't want to miss that. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to be separated from God. It's not a good place to be. So if you would like to repent now and, and be saved, you can say this prayer with me now. Dear God, I come to you today to confess that I am a sinner. And I know now that I need a Savior. And I know that Savior is Yeshua, is Jesus. He is the Messiah. He's the only Messiah that there was and ever will be. And he is coming again to rule and reign. I believe Jesus died on a cross. I believe he was buried. I believe he was resurrected. And I do understand and believe that he is coming again. I don't want to be left behind. I want to become a member of the family of God. I want to be a child of God. And I know that that has to happen in order for me to even have a chance of getting to heaven. And I know that is what I want. I thank you. Jesus, I thank you, Yeshua, for everything that you've done for me. I declare that you are the Lord. You are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. I'm asking you to please forgive me for anything that I have ever done, known or unknown. And I'm asking you to be Lord of my life to rule and reign in my heart forever. I accept the gift of salvation and, and the gift of eternal life that you, you have given to me through the sacrifice of your life. Thank you for paying my sin debt in full. I declare you Lord of my life from this day forward to rule and reign in my heart. Please, please send your Holy Spirit to live inside of me, to guide me, direct me in all of your ways for the rest of my life. I believe through you and you alone 
Yeshua, that I am saved, I am healed, I am born again, set free and delivered from sin and the consequences of sin, and I believe also that I am healed and now healthy of mind, body, and soul in Yeshua's, Jesus' precious and mighty, awesome name. Amen and amen. And if you have said this prayer with me, welcome to the family of God. I am going to encourage you to get into a Bible-based church or Messianic congregation, one that teaches directly from the Bible. And I am also going to encourage you to get a copy of the Bible so that you know that you know um, that what you're being preached is biblical and sound doctrine there are so there's so much false doctrine that is out there um today and you need to be discerning and this is this is one of the gifts also of the holy spirit um that discerns that helps you to discern um what is what is really truth so I'm going to encourage you to get a copy of the Bible um, so that you read the Bible and you get to know the heart of your father. De also start to develop a relationship with Father God. Start talking to him. Pray to him. Um, he loves to hear his children talk to him. He wants a relationship. He doesn't care about religion. So it doesn't really matter if you're Baptist, Pentecostal, you're Methodist, you're Presbyterian. Your messianic Jew, it doesn't matter. In heaven, there are no denominations. And uh, just to let you know, also, Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA is a non denominational. Uh, it, we are non denominational based on Ephesians chapter 2. One new man, both Jew and Gentile, both Jew and non-Jew, believers in Yeshua, born again and saved. That's all. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. Amen? Amen. So we're going to now proceed with going into um, preparing for uh, communion, coming to the table of the Lord. And you do need to be prepared to do this. This is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, it is very serious. We are remembering. Um, on the night that Yeshua was betrayed, he had he had met um, in the upper room. Um, this was the eve of Passover, and he actually instituted um, the elements and um, of Holy Communion, but he asked us to do this in remembrance of him until he returns again. So this is, and, and as we know, he died on the cross. It's very, it's a very solemn, very serious uh, remembrance. We're remembering what he did for us to redeem us. And if you've, if 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 you had just said that the the, the this, the prayer with me for salvation, you are welcome to join us in this communion as well. But we're going to, we're going to start with having a proper attitude for the Lord's Supper. Therefore, who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man ex examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And this is also male and female, himself, herself. Um, there are two ways that someone could take the Lord's Supper. And Paul makes this clear to the members of this church that he is addressing. And he makes, us, makes it plain to us as well. So the first type of person is the type that you want to be and that is those who examine themselves before taking the supper the ones who examine themselves before they partake of the supper are the ones who are taking it in a worthy manner for what are they examining themselves for for sin 
sin keeps us from a right relationship with the Lord. When we examine ourselves, we are to confess it. And God has promised to forgive us and restore us to proper fellowship with him. First John chapter one, verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can you sin after you've had salvation? Yes. <laughs> and you, you, this is why you, you, we're human. And actually, Adonai knows that. Um, Jesus knows that. This is why we needed a savior in the first place, because we're not perfect like he is. Not one of us. So, yes, we, and this is why we take the time prior to doing communion to make sure that our hearts are right with, with God. We need to be sure that we, we have examined ourselves and, and we have asked, we, what I'm going to do is when uh, I'm going to pause it at one point for you to go get the elements um, that you want to use for communion. And during that time, you can, you can use that time for individual prayer and confession to the Lord. Okay. The second type of person um, is that person that uh, the, the, those people are judged for not examining themselves. And this group makes up uh, individuals in the church who choose to come to church flippantly. They're not taking sin seriously. Uh, that could be plaguing their lives. And these people may have said they accepted Yeshua as their savior, um, but are living an uncommitted life. They are, they are those that we, we sometimes call Saturday or, or, or Sunday believers. And, and those outside the church call these people hypocrites because they, they, they see the way that they're living. And they're not living, you know, they're going to, they may be going to church one day out of a week and that's it. And then they live like the rest of the world. Well, that is not what we're to do. We're, we're to be separated from the world. Once you're born again and saved, you know, we are in the world, but not of it. We need to be separate and, and a, a holy people to the Lord. Amen. Amen. This group is also known to the pastor as individuals who sit, soak and sour in the pews. They are usually the ones who find fault in everything in the church. And they are the, the ones who normally are not even involved in daily Bible reading or, and, and, there are many things that separate them from God. And this type of person needs to reflect and repent before taking the Lord's Supper. For the Lord will not tolerate this behavior. There are consequences. And for this reason, many are weak and sick among you. Many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Many become weak and sickly, and this type of judgment is called chastening. And those individuals who have, who have accepted Yeshua as their Savior, but are not living for the Lord, will be judged by the Lord. If any of you is living a life of sin, but is not being chastened or disciplined, check yourself to be sure that you're truly saved, that you truly, you're a true believer. Going to church does not mean that you're saved. I mean, you can be born and go to church from the time you were an infant to the time that you die. But if you've never accepted Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, you're not saved. You're not born again. And so you need to check yourself. And, you, and if you're not sure, you can always go back and, and say that prayer that we have just said earlier. The Bible says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. We see many believers who are in this condition. And um, I am just going to say before you involve yourself in the remembrance of Christ, of Yeshua's sacrifice, repent, be restored and renewed. Many die and the judgment is terminal. And the Bible uses the term sleep when it talks about a believer's death. And here we find that some believers die prematurely because of sin in their lives. So the scripture tells us when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And that's in James chapter 1, verse 15. The Corinthian church has some real problems. And the church today has many of the same problems. 
There are believers who come to the Lord's table without examining their lives, and they are challenging Adonai's word, and they will lose. Adonai's, it, it, it will deal with that, and you can best believe. And if you are here today and have not been examining your life for sin, I would challenge you today to examine your relationship with the Lord. Are you in fellowship with him? Are you keeping short accounts with him? If there is sin in your life, are you willing to confess it, turn from it, and follow the Lord more closely? Only you can make that decision. The Lord's Supper can be an experience of worship and worthiness, a time of repentance and remembrance, or it can be a time of disobedience, which will result in God's ultimate discipline. So let's spend some time in prayer and self-examination before we partake in the Lord's Supper. And like I said, when I pause it for you to gather the elements that you're going to use, that is the time that um, you can also take to confess your sin. So we're going to talk about the elements now. Um, the bread um, is one of the elements, and that is used to represent. It is not the Bahari of, of Yeshua. It's used as a symbol to represent. Remember, we're doing this in remembrance of Yeshua. He's already died on the cross, and he's only going to do it once. That's it. And he has asked us to, to do this in remembrance of him. So the bread, um, I use matzah. You can, you, if you don't have matzah, it is okay. You can use regular bread, even a cracker. If that's all you have, the Lord knows your heart. The reason why I use matzah is there's no yeast in it and yeast is representative of sin. So by using matzah, we're not using hamats or, or, um, or yeast. It's, it's the flat, it looks like a flat cracker because there's no, uh, it doesn't rise like bread, bread would. So the bread was to represent the body of Yeshua that died on the cross for our sins. He suffered many abuses on his way to the cross and his body was in rough shape on the cross. He suffered on the cross and he gave his life for all of us. The next element is the cup. The cup was used to represent the blood that Yeshua shed on the cross for our sins. He also shed blood before he uh, went to the cross. As, as I mentioned uh, earlier in, in uh, when we were, we, we were doing the salvations, the altar call, the Roman soldiers beat him brutally and he bled. And he was, he was, he was unrecognizable on the cross. They say um, and he was so disfigured from that and that alone. Um, so there was a lot of bloodshed um, that he did for us. The Bible says, though, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Yeshua had to shed his blood for us. And as I mentioned earlier, there were animal sacrifices, um, and those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament looked ahead to the time when Yeshua would shed his blood for the sins of the world. So, so the animal sacrifices were like a type and, type and shadow. Yeshua's sacrifice was the final one needed to save the world. His blood was enough for all those who accept him as their personal savior. Paul tells us that the celebra celebrating with these elements reminds the people of the church of Yeshua's sacrifice. We so often and so easily forget, so often complain about small sacrifices we must make, ignoring the incredible sacrifice of Yeshua's body and blood. Now, I mentioned um, the repentance that is necessary um, prior to um, taking communion and confessing your sins, making sure that your heart is right with the Lord before you actually take communion. Communion. I'm going to give you an example of what a repentant heart looks like. And um, King David, King David communed with the Lord from the time he was a youth. Uh, he was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. Um, and he loved the Lord with all of his heart. God actually uh, called him a man after his own heart. And, and, and the Lord loved him as well. 
However, there was a time in David's life that he sinned and he, he did a very, very serious sin. He actually committed adultery uh, with Uriah the Hittite's wife. And to make matters worse, Bathsheba was the woman and she became pregnant with David's child. Now, of course, if they had, he was the king, I mean, and he was judging people and actually uh, one of the, one of the punishments for adultery back in that time was, was they would be stoned to death. And here you have your king um, having committed adultery. So to make matters worse, he thought he could cover it up. So he pulled Uriah the Hittite, who was Bathsheba's husband, out of battle uh, with the intention of having uh, Uriah go home to Bathsheba, have relations with Bathsheba, and voila, they could pass the baby off as Uriah's. There was still enough time for that to happen in, in, in his mind, he thought. So he got Uriah drunk and sent and told them to go home. Well, Uriah was a loyal soldier, and he was also he was also loyal to his comrades and didn't think it was fair for him to go home when others could not. So he stayed with the troops. Well, this just became more of an issue for for David because now he had to think up another plan um, to cover this up and. So he did the unthinkable. He actually wrote orders to put Uriah in the heat of the battle where Uriah would be killed in battle. And that is exactly what happened. Um, interestingly enough, Uriah carried those orders back. And he was so loyal he, and, and so trustworthy that he didn't peek. But unfortunately, Uriah lost his life. So David went on to marry Bathsheba. So um, it was still in the time frame that he could, you know, could have passed that off as, you know, that not having committed adultery, that it happened in, within a time frame. But um, God sees everything. God saw what he did, and God was not happy with David at that point. So he sent Nathan the prophet to confront him. Now, <clears throat> That was a real risky thing for Nathan to do because to confront the king and in a matter the manner that he had um, and and because of the 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 issue that he was confronting him with, he could have actually lost his life. but no, David loved the Lord that much um, that when he was confronted and it hit him uh, how far that he had fallen, he was very sorrowful. he was afraid that that Adonai would leave him, take his spirit from him. He felt crushed. And as we read uh, Psalm 51, you're going you're gonna to hear how, how heartbroken David was, feeling like he was, all the bones in his body was, was crushed. And he totally understood, too. He was a very rich man. He could have given all kinds of offers to God, but he understood that that meant nothing. God wanted him to have a contrite heart and to really, really be sorry for what he had done and really be repentant. So he got what that, he, he, he got it. He knew what, the, what he needed to, to, to present himself as. And then he said, you know, once he is forgiven, um, then and only then would Adonai accept offerings from him. Well, God is not about ceremony and uh, he's about honesty and 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 truth and and you know worshiping and truth as well. So um, you know rituals are for pagans, um, and we're not to be ritualistic. We need to we need to be true to 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 Father God. So I'm going to read um, Psalm 51 now, and you'll hear the anguish in David's. In, in David's writing, because this is uh, a psalm that was written by King David. Create in me a clean heart, O God, to the choir master, a psalm of David. When Nathan the prophet went to him 
after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a will, will, willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. And that is Psalm 51. So I'm going to pause it now for you to go ahead and um, gather the elements that you want to use for taking communion. And then we'll come back and we'll take communion together and we'll close out this evening service. And also, while you're gathering the elements to confess your sins and, and, and pray to the Lord. So I'm going to pause it right now. Okay. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me now? Father God, we come to this table as your guests, resting only in the worthiness of your Son. As we look upon the emblems of our Savior's death, may we remember why he died. To cleanse and to heal, to satisfy your righteousness and justice. He died for our sins, each and every one of us, so that we could be reconciled to you so we could be with you. We remember his eternal love and boundless grace. May we receive the assurance of forgiveness, eternal life, and the hope of glory as the bread and cup nourish our body. So may your indwelling Holy Spirit strengthen our soul until the day of Yeshua's appearing when we will hunger and thirst no more and sit with him in, at his heavenly table. Yeshua, we thank you for everything that you have done to save us. We love you, and we are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. Say with me now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You take that piece of matzah or bread or cracker in your hand now. Remember, this is a symbol of the body that was broken for each and every one of us. We're doing this in remembrance of what Jesus, what Yeshua has done for us. The Lord Yeshua, Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Now take the cup of either grape juice, wine, or even even water is fine, 
the Lord knows your heart. This is a symbol of the blood that was shed by Yeshua. This we're doing in remembrance of him. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you loved us, that Yeshua loved us so much that he came and died for each and every one of us and saved it and gave us that path for redemption because we could never have done it on our own. We thank you so much. And we love you. We worship you. We adore you. Yeshua, you are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. And we long for the day that you are here as our King, as our resurrected King, ruling and reigning the entire world. We love you. In the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. May you walk in the light as he is in the light. May you have fellowship with one another. For the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and the love of God, and the communion of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen. And we're going to bring this service to a close with the Aaronic blessing, or what is known as the priestly blessing. This is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27, when Adonai spoke to Moses, telling Moses to speak to Aaron and his sons, giving them the exact words to speak over Benai Israel, the children of Israel, and they shall put his name upon the children of Israel and he would bless them. As a member of the family of God, God loves to bless his children. This blessing is for all of the members of the family of God. In Hebrew, it goes like this: Ivarekaka Adonai veishmareka, Yae Adonai panavaleka vikuneka, Isa Adonai panavaleka veasemleka shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up a countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom, Amen and Amen. Kodesh Tov. Have a have a good month of Tammuz. God bless each and every one of you.